With that, we would love to introduce our guest host, Mr. William C. Roden, award-winning journalist and author of $40 Million Slaves. He is also the editor and writer at large at ESPN's The Undefeated, as well as visiting senior practitioner with the Global Sport Institute. We will be dropping our uh, uh, GSM uh, uh, website that has the uh, panelists bios as well, but in the interest of time, we wanted to get started with the conversation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you so much, Kendall. I'm very excited about this conversation today. We have a, uh, just a tremendous uh, panel, uh, many of whom I've, I've known and uh, worked with. Uh, so it's, it's a great panel and a great topic. Um, you know, as many of you know, uh, HBCUs were founded in Pennsylvania and Ohio before the Civil War uh, with the, you know, the purpose of basically uh, providing, uh, you know, African-American youth uh, who are largely prevented from obtaining uh, education uh, uh, with the opportunity to learn and to be educated. And so there's a very deep history of, uh, of historically black and college education uh, uh, universities. And uh, as, as time went on, um, as you know, today, most young African-American students uh, go to what we call PWIs, which is predominantly white institutions, uh, though the largest concentration of black students are still at the nation's uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, but over time, there's, come, uh, there's become an issue that we're gonna talk about today. And really, uh, we're gonna reference um, Jamel Hill, uh, 2019, Jamel Hill obviously was a longtime ESPN uh, writer and personality now working with The Atlantic. But she wrote a, 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 a controversial article in 2019 in which she's, she basically called on elite African-American athletes to go back to black colleges, to give their labor to black colleges. And so we're gonna, uh, that's what we're gonna talk about uh, uh, this evening with our panel, some of whom have attended uh, HBCUs, others who have attended and gone to uh, predominantly white schools, some have done both. So I'm really looking forward to a really stimulating uh, conversation. Uh, before we get into that conversation, I want to reference uh, a couple of polling questions or one polling questions uh, that, um, that we've got. And uh, I'll, I'll ask the panelists to exit for the time being while I ask this question. Uh, okay, the, uh, this would be a pretty good question actually. The question uh, is, is this, do you believe that exposure and opportunity follow an elite college athlete no matter where he or she attends college? I'll ask it again. Do you believe that exposure and opportunity follow an elite college athlete, no matter where he or she attends college? Uh, the multiple choice answers are A, the school gives more exposure and opportunity. B, the athlete is a talent and exposure and opportunity would follow the athlete. C, it's a combination of both. Or D, I don't know. We'll give everybody nope. just a couple of seconds to get their answers in there. Okay. Thank you, Bill. All right. And I know what I'd say. The vote as well. <laughs> <laughs> How many times? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and end this poll. All right. Looking at the results here. So to the answer uh, to the question, do you believe that exposure and opportunity follow an elite college athlete no matter where they attend college? Looks like it's a combination of both is what most people think. Bill, turn it back over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, hmm, interesting, as they say. Um, let's begin our discussion. And, and uh, Ron, uh, Ron Thomas, uh, who's at Morehouse, teaches at Morehouse, 
I want to start with you. Um, it, obviously, you and I have spoken about this for a long time. Uh, you, you mentioned that this topic comes up in your classroom every single year. What, 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 uh, what do your students say about the topic? Well, you know, they just feel that HBCU sports doesn't get any publicity. And um, they feel that if there were, I mean, their dream would be if a Fab Five came to Morehouse and, you know, brought all the national publicity and everything that comes along with it. But basketball, it doesn't have to be five. You know, if you get one great, one elite player and one sort of just a little bit below that, you can build um, an excellent team just around two good players. And so um, they, and, and they would hope that they would love to see a, a high profile high, high school player come to come to Morehouse. And they think it would be beneficial to the player because of the unique cultural experience you get at a black college. And it would be beneficial to the college because it would bring us the type of national exposure that HBCUs don't don't get. Uh, what, what was your what's your take on uh, Jamel's uh, uh, 2019 article, uh, uh, tell, you know, suggesting that the, the elite black athletes go to uh, the HBCUs? Well, you know, it, it, you'd have to have a broad-minded young man, and I think at their age, it's it's um it's difficult to get beyond thinking of being on ESPN and um and and being interviewed and in the NCAA. I mean, all of those things now are part of being an elite high school athlete. So you would, I think, the athlete would really have to one have a great appreciation for an edu education and um and unique ex black experience that you get. And the other thing is, I think that that um, athlete would have to have a great deal of trust in the athletic department and the sports information department. Feel if I'm a success here, the athletic department is going to find a way to promote me. And so, when it comes to my ultimate goal, which is going to be being drafted by, by an NBA team, it won't hurt my draft pros prospects. So, I think that BCU um, is going to have to be committed to that to be able to to attract those top, type of top athletes. Uh, uh uh, Edward, I want to bring you in. I mean, you you had an extraordinary uh, career as an athlete. Uh, you were the epitome of the student athlete. I wonder what you think about the same question. I guess how often, as you were going, yeah, you know, well, what was your experience uh, at Morehouse? And as you traveled around uh, the world, and as you competed against athletes from the, the big schools to everyone, did you ever? Did you ever second guess yourself? What, what did you think about your experience at Morehouse? And when you look back, would you have made the same decision? Uh, looking back, I'm, I'm glad that I made the decision. Uh, number one, I looked like Urkel. I was an academic nerd coming out of high school, 5'7 and 117 pounds uh, my junior year in high school. I wasn't on track to get a, a college scholarship. And uh, my mom was attending an academic uh, educators meeting in San Francisco and met a woman here in Atlanta. Uh, that was in the education system, and I found out about the dual degree scholarship. So I came to Morehouse strictly on an academic basis, and I had a four-year scholarship to study engineering and physics. So I didn't come in on the athletic track, uh, but I, I guess I went out on the athlete, athlete, athletic track. Uh, in response to your question, when I was running, absolutely, I agree with what um, Ron says. It was absolutely no correlation between what I accomplished in 1976 the type of uh, publicity that I got in through until halfway through my career was just, um, uh, it uh, was not where it should have been. And it was because of the way that af uh, black athletes were covered journalistically back then, especially being at an HBCU where um, we had a journalist down there, uh, a, a black journalist that covered the HBCUs. And all they would do was these tiny little box scores on track meets <clears throat> and even football games. And meanwhile, the other largest schools in the state would have all the uh, all the space in the uh, we used to be the Atlanta Constitution Journal. I was very upset about that and in fact complained uh, all the way up to the editorial level of the of the um, uh, of the newspaper up until one day before I ran my Olympic final because they had not given me my proper due. So um, going to an HBCU then definitely had its uh, its uh, negative effects. However during the time that I went to college and, and, and the 20 years before me, 
most of your NFL uh, Hall of Famers, NBA Hall of Famers, guys like Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe, um, Willie Lanier, I'm talking uh, uh, Southern University, Lane, Kentucky State, Grambling Southern, FAMU, all of the NFL players came from HBCUs. And so I've uh, always seen a day, whereas uh, African-American uh, athletes and other athletes of color, they just don't have to be black from America, but uh, from Africa and, and the Middle East and wherever, uh, that there was a renaissance in terms of getting the best students uh, to come back to the, to the institutions. You see what happened at Jackson State uh, when they, they got Dion, uh, Dion, uh, um, Dion Sanders. So I think that uh, in my sport, it's easy. You know, track is an individual sport, but I do think that there should be a time coming when, when the HBCUs again can participate in the in the revenues, the, the generous revenues that are coming uh, to these other major universities with students that would have been uh, relegated to go to HBCUs, you know, had they come up in the 50s and 60s. So I, I think that there should be a reversal of that. And I'm fighting for that uh, at Morehouse. We our, our job is to get the best students academically. Uh, and, and, and if they're going to make pro or not is, is secondary to our mission of academics. But I'd like to see a day when we have a, uh, a division two football team that could be competitive. We're there in basketball and we're there in track at division two, but uh, the revenue sharing part of it, we've missed out on, out on, and I'd like to see that come back. Yeah, you know, I, I wanna uh, bring Everson in uh, on this quickly, Everson Walls, who obviously starred in Grambling. Uh, Everson, do you think that, that same general question, now you came during a time to Grambling where you know, I think what uh, Edwin was talking about, the further you go back in, in, in history, the more African-Americans pretty much, you know, you, you had to go to certain school, you know, to certain uh, HBCUs. By the time you came to Grambling, uh, that wasn't necessarily the truth. So I guess my question to you was, uh, looking back, would you have made the same decision? And in terms of elite black athletes going to HBCUs, do you think that horse has left the barn already. You think that we'll ever get back uh, to, to, to that? Well, my opportunity uh, to go to Grambling State University came up pretty organically. Um, I didn't really have a bunch of choices, Bill. That's just the way it was. So uh, you could talk to maybe somebody else who might be, uh, I guess back in the day, they called them blue chippers uh, back in, in the day as far as football players were concerned. Yeah, all the, all the odds were stacked up against me and anyone else that wanted to go to an HBCU. Back in 1977, so as much as I'm not as old as some of you guys, uh, I'm still kind of on the edge. Uh, the, the example that uh, Edwin was talking about was, uh, was, was clear with me. Uh, when Doug Williams was there, uh, my freshman year, 1977, Doug Williams was one of the hottest names in college sports. And he was one of the hottest names in college sports because number one, he was damn good. Number two, he had Eddie Robinson as his head coach. So that's almost a perfect situation for that. Uh, it's almost as if when you look back at the, the, the scouts were, how can I say it? They were forced to come to Grand. Uh, usually they don't wanna make that stop. They don't, even, they don't even wanna go to Louisiana Tech for the most part which is two miles away in Ruston, Louisiana. Uh, they, they don't really want to make too many stops in Baton Rouge. They want to go straight down to LSU and see what's going on on that campus. So Doug Williams was an inconvenience for those scouts. And once Doug left, they couldn't wait to, to leave as well. I'm talking about the exposure and things of that nature that, that uh, we had. We went on, as my team did, to be one of the most successful teams that Eddie Robinson ever had that no one ever heard of. Uh, we ended up being in the 1AA uh, semifinals against Boise State, who was 1AA at the time. And, uh, you know, once we were out, we were out. Uh, there were no scouts waiting on us. There was no headway. There was no uh, uh, fanfare. And so I went into the pro in that same manner. Uh, and so what was disappointing was those guys that were left behind, they were in the same position then that we're in now. Um, and so that's, that's just the way it is. And that's the way uh, uh, my career ended up. And I must say, 
as you look at my career or anyone, uh, including Aeneas Williams, whose uh, uh, daughter will be coming up pretty soon, very proud of him. Aeneas Williams was an exception to the rule, the fact that he got the exposure that he got. Uh, anytime that you made plays or didn't make plays in the NFL, you hardly heard of what, what school you came from if you were from an HBCU. They rarely called out your name. Whenever you see a quarterback, you talk about, uh, I think his name is uh, Fitzgerald right now with the Dolphins. They always point out that he's an Ivy League quarterback as if that makes him better. It does. You know, when they talk about black schools, if they want to mention uh, anything about your black school, it seems to come up in a negative uh, connotation. And that, that always upset me going back to the 80s. I always felt that also uh, when it came to negotiations in your contracts, guys like Gil Brandt, uh, these are the GMs of some of the, the uh, uh, rich uh, organizations in the NFL. They, I felt that they treated HBCU athletes differently and worse than you would treat uh, players from the PWI. Now, all of us got treated like crap, but I still <laughs> think just like Corona, we're always gonna be uh, disproportionately affected. And that has gone on to me, that has gone on since the NFL has been in existence. Uh, you know, I wanna follow, I wanna bring in time, but I wanna ask you and Edwin uh, a, 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 a one more question. And that's, you know, I thank God that I went to Morgan. You know, I just thank God that I went to Morgan. Uh, you know, but one of my my fears was, well, what happened if I was actually really, really good coming out of high school and was recruited? Uh, would I have been able to resist the pull of these big schools? You know, would I have been able to, you know, they take you to USC and that, would I have been able to resist the pull of those schools and go to where I really should have gone, which was to Morgan? And I'm asking you the same question. Um, you know, you've been around, both of you guys have been around, you've been on some of the great campuses in the country. Um, do you ever think about what would have happened if, and do you think, you and uh, uh, Edwin, would you have been able to resist the pull of these big schools if they decided they wanted you? Well, I didn't have to resist because I was unrecruitable anyway. That was probably <laughs> the reason that I made the decision that I did. But I will say that uh, had I not gone to Morehouse, I would have never gone to the Olympics. I don't care what school I would have been to because it was what I got from the school. Being in an environment, I came out of high school very bright and academic with five years of math and two years of chemistry, two years of physics, two years of biology, uh, summer school and all that, physics as well. And so when I got to Morehouse, I thought I was going to be the smartest kid down there. But being in that competitive, competitive environment, with young boys, we were boys when we first got there to look like men, that pulled me up, uh, 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 not only academically, uh, but it, it, it taught me about leadership, persistence, and, uh, and, and Morehouse didn't have a track when I went to school. I was jumping fences, running hurdles in the hallway. Uh, I mean, I, I'm fabled around that, uh, around that story. I go on campus and the young athletes say, oh, I heard you used to run hurdles in the hallway, is that true or not? Absolutely true, but we had no track. Had to uh, carpool every day to find a track for the five years I was here. And the things that I learned and what I had to do to be successful, it would have never happened anywhere. If I was good enough to have gone to a UCLA or Ohio State, which what wouldn't recruit me because I wasn't that good, I doubt seriously if I would have been around, uh, been an Olympian because of the power uh, and, and the nurturing and the kind of uh, respect and treatment and provocation in a positive, positive sense that I got as a young black man at 18 years old. I would have never gone to the Olympics no matter what the campus looked like. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I'm sure of that, absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. and, and in the 1976 Olympics and running events, Morehouse College won more medals than UCLA, USC, everybody else in the country because I was the only one to win one in a running event. We only won four, and they came from San Jose State, uh, San Diego State, uh, actually two of them from uh, San Jose State, Discus and, and Bruce Jenner, and another Arnie Robinson in the long jump. So I won more medals in every every Division One school in the country coming from Morehouse, jumping fences every day with no track. And the power that I learned and what I learned as a young man to be invincible when the odds are completely against you. No one, I would have never got that 
gotten that anywhere else in the world. So had I not gone to Morehouse, no one would know who I am today. Everson, same same question to you. Could you have resisted the, the pull and do you think your life would have turned, I mean, it's been, turned out pretty well, but do you ever think about that? Well, yeah, I do. And uh, I must admit, uh, I, 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 some people know my fabled story. I don't know if this is great as Edwin's. This guy was amazing. But I followed my girlfriend, who's now my wife, to Grant. I didn't even have basically an offer from anyone. But I do recall when I filled it out and, and they asked you uh, for colleges to pick, I did not pick an HBCU, not, not one. I, I, I chose Texas, USC, uh, schools that you would see frequently uh, on, on, on TV. And uh, I'm just like Edwin. Uh, the nurturing that I had at Grambling, uh, the challenges that were posed to me at Grambling, the uh, lack of excuses that Grambling would, uh, would hold me to, those things that what really made me uh, what I was. My roommates, uh, you know, Dwight Scales was uh, his, his little brother, Jerry Gordon, was my roommate. Immediately, he showed me what dedication was all about. I went down there like Bambi, man. I had no legs under me mentally. Uh, you know, I, I needed much more than what uh, a PWI could offer me. I probably would have uh, been, been uh, swatted to the side because I still had those personal issues. Uh, no, uh, no white person, I'll put it like this, maybe two white people in my entire life before I went to Grambling actually showed any interest in me. And it happened to be through sports. Uh, one was Pee Wee League and the other was my senior year in high school. I didn't play until my senior year. And it was because Coach Holiday gave me that shot. Uh, but I don't see anybody like a Coach Holiday uh, that would be at a PWI that would put as much effort into me as Eddie Robinson did. I can't see any roommates that I would have been uh, uh, roomed with that would give me much inspiration that Jerry Gordon and Mike Haynes gave me. I just couldn't see that happening. So I'm just like uh, Edwin. It's no way I would have been who I was today. And I probably would have been even more angry now than I was before I went to Grambling State because being at Grambling gave me a sense of self. Being at a PWI would never give me that. Mm. Right. Thomas, let me bring you in because you, you been in a very, you're in a very unique situation. You've been on both sides, an HBCU alum, uh, now uh, athletic director at UC Riverside. Uh, so tell me what you bring into this, this non-HBCU space. And some of the same questions uh, that I asked uh, uh, Edwin and Everett. So I know a lot of stuff was run through your head, but your, your, your take on this, you've been on both sides. Yeah, I, I have a lot running through my head right now and I'm, I'm starstruck. Um, just hearing some of these stories. So I, I um, am born in the 70s, okay? So when y'all were going off to college, <laughs> how about that? Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to hear your stories because from my perspective, um, HBCUs begin the real racial equity work and diversity, equity, inclusion work. And I was fortunate as a 17, 18 year old to be recruited um, at the division one level by a predominantly white institution and uh, made that decision to attend there. I wrote a book about the journey of uh, all in a dream, um, sharing that journey as I, I transferred to a HBCU after my sophomore year. Academically, it was glorious. I, I never, um, socially, I was totally disconnected. Um, I never had to call my parents for any substance. You know, I had the best meal plans, the best study tables, the, the best, uh, tutors, the best academic support, um, but I I didn't understand what I know now in integrating a, a campus um, as a Black woman, and I think that every day um, those complexities and those many layers um, kind of trigger me in the work that I do even right now at the University of California, Riverside, where I'm very conscious of um, student athletes experience and that's one of my my number one top priorities and and making sure we're we're H HSI uh, and and so you know I get a chance to to work with a lot of first generation and I represent all of our student athletes no matter their race ethnicity um, identities or whatever but um, 
I lead with empathy because of the way that I experienced both institutions as an 18 to 22 year old. And as a black woman in sport um, education and you know leadership, you can imagine the intersections of all of that and how it just you know drives me um, every day. So I, I think that you know to pose the question of of you know do you have to do either or? I think it's it, it really is about fit, and I hate fit because you can imagine I do a lot of interviews, I, I hire a lot of people, and you know I think fit personally my dis, my thoughts about fit is it's another way to discriminate. You don't fit what we're already doing. And so right. I, I don't use that a lot. I don't use that a lot at all. But I do understand, you know, having experienced it on, on many levels, um, you know, how sometimes you can, you can see the lip service. You can see, um, you know, institutions having the mission and not really, you know, aligning with it. And it comes from hiring. And, and I'm very fortunate to be hired by a white male, Kim Wilcox. Um, at the University of California, Riverside. I'd like to think that I wasn't hired because I was a black woman for sure. I'm the first in the seat, I think in the state at the division one level um, to be um, appointed to the position full time. But um, I think that he knew that I would lead all of the student athletes in a way that they will have ex an, a great experience but develop in, a, as a person holistically. And that's what I got most of my HBCU experience. And that was a holistic development that I absolutely need every day. We, we skipped a couple of steps here. I don't read the book, but let's go back. You transferred. You were there for two years. Uh, Where did you transfer and why did you transfer? Uh, and then I want to ask you about the differences that you see today. But where did you transfer and why did you transfer? Where did I transfer to? I, I transferred to yeah. Alabama A&M in Huntsville, which my whole family is from Alabama. I'm from the ATL. So I transferred from an institution also in Alabama. So it wasn't about the state of Alabama, let me be clear. <laughs> but, um, and, and the reason why was, it was just a social disconnect. So you think about, you know, and I don't want to stereotype, but there's a lot of erroneous stereotypes that are put on, uh, I'll just speak for myself, as a black woman, you know, scholar athlete at that time, um, the, the bias that I, you know, saw and the, the cultural incompetence to be able to, you know, you know, give me an environment and, and my, my, my uh, peers an environment that we could thrive in and connect. Um, you think about, you know, the sports like golf and softball, baseball, they have real different cultures. I, I see that even as an athletic director right now, I, I have to, you know, communicate with them very differently. Um, but, you know, I think, at, you know, on college campuses, it's our job to educate and to, you know, continue to, to develop and we have to take it seriously. And I don't, I don't think that um, during the set, I, I, I realized that the institution that I was um, first at, John Lewis was denied access to it. Mm. I got a full, I got a full scholarship because of my talent to play basketball to it, to attend. And you know, sometimes it just pains me to think how far we've come, but still how far we do have to go to make sure that um, all of our student athletes and students um, don't feel some of the hurdles and barriers just because you know that we don't have the most equipped and experienced uh, professionals in front of them. It, it can't be about just X's and O's because at the end of the day, everybody's not going to go pro. We're going to go pro in a whole lot of other things other than yeah. sport. Yeah. Uh, just, um, just one question hey, before I let you go. You have the okay. yeah, please. Yeah, please. You know, uh, at Grambling, uh, just a, she was just a shooting star. We had this young lady just a couple years ago named uh, Shaquilla Hill. Oh, you yeah. Ever heard of her? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, triple double magic. Yeah. You know, every time she plays, and Tamika, I'm sure she's heard of her. I have no idea where she is right now. You know, and, and it's just an example of, you know, we talk about black colleges, black men, but, but you know, just like in the corona, we've, we've also noticed that Black women are really being treated uh, and affected even more, more so than African-American men. And, and this is just an example as far as the, the athletes are concerned. You know, this, this young lady should have been an All-American. She mm -hmm. should have been an All-American no matter what level it's on. And she was considered just an oddity uh, and someone that should quickly be forgotten. And when you look at what she did, 
at Grambling State University. It's historic, not just at an HBCU, but also from any PWI. And she was just ignored. And when Tamika brought up being a cager, you know, it just kind of, I just had to mention that about how, you know, that's just another example about how uh, uh, HBCU, especially female athletes, are just uh, uh, being ignored. Right. Let, let me, um, I want to bring in Victoria, but I want everybody to comment on this. Uh, the Global Sports Institute recently published a field uh, study looking at Power Five schools. Now, we all know that I always refer to the Power Five schools almost as the biggest plantation because you've got all these young black athletes, you know, toting that ball, lifting that bell. But when, when it comes time to hire as head coaches and, and beyond, they're like, no, all y'all do is basically tote that bar, lift that bell. We'll do, you know, we'll do the head coaching and all that stuff. But do you guys think that, and let's start with you, but if elite black athletes began attending HBCUs in significant numbers, do you think that that dynamic would change? Do you think that would open up uh, new opportunities for head coaches and other executive positions? Uh, what, what do you think, um, uh, Victoria? Well, yes. Um, I think it depends on the sport. I think basketball is the, the opportunity um, because of that roster size. I think football, we, we've gone too far down the, the professionalization road in the Power Five. And um, I would actually be uh, nervous about the, the health and safety <laughs> Of, of a football team playing for an HBCU and, and not having the resources that the Power Five schools have at this point. So that, that would be my response. Um, the professional collegiate, the other interesting thing with basketball, are there, there are alternative pathways um, to the pros and those are expanding. So the professional collegiate league, um, Andy Schwartz and that crew, um, actually, so this is, a, this is an idea to kind of bust the NCAA monopoly on this pathway to the NBA and to um, not give up the collegiate education. Um, so the, the PCL is going to be a professional league, but part of that compensation package is a college scholarship. And that team had actually pitched it to HBCUs to try to get them to leave the NCAA and try a new model. I don't think it's, I mean, it's a power play, right? That the power dynamics, you know, when you're a uh, public HBCU and part of a state system and your funding is dependent on a state legislature and that state legislature cheers for that those PWIs in the state and they don't want to see the talent go away of, of course that that's politically impossible but there there are different pathways one of those could be and I would say should be through the HBCUs for sure. Right. And, and, any other uh, thoughts on that uh, uh, on whether elite athletes going to uh, HBCUs would change the dynamic? Or is it elite black athletes saying that they want to play for black coaches wherever they are? I mean, what, what would change this dynamic? Going to HBCUs or elite black athletes saying, listen, we want to play for black head coaches and people have shown willingness to hire black people. No, I, I think it's the, uh, the HBCU angle. I mean, it's, to me, uh, that's what we need. Now, uh, Victoria was correct. <laughs> For football, that, that, that horse has left the barn a long time ago. Uh, and she talked about the health of some of the players. They had one uh, uh, a highlight or low light of a young man that was paralyzed by, he was, he was a defensive back and he was paralyzed by one of the PWI, he was a punter or a kicker, paralyzed this young man. So yes, there those, those situations in football, it, it, it's it's over. But when it comes to uh, the other sports track, as Edwin talked about, talking about basketball, yeah, I think they should consider, uh, as Jamil said uh, in her article, these are the kind of things that should be considered. You can make a big difference at HBCUs. Now, one thing we, we're talking about athletes going to HBCUs, but Dion going to Jackson State, as Edwin mentioned, that's going to have a big influx, I do believe, in the monies that are available for not just Jackson State, but for the entire SWAC itself, Southwestern Athletic Conference. So that's 
we're transcending athletes and going straight to the top as far as coaches are concerned. Just think of how many players are going to come to Jackson State now because of Dion being there. Just think of how many players are going to say, okay, I want to go to Alcorn and play against Jackson State. I want to be in the SWAC at Grambling so that I can beat Jackson State. So that type of uh, competition, that, that breeds uh, more competition and more opportunities for any athlete that want, wants to go there, especially in the uh, basketball and track arena. Hey, Bill, Kamika, think, let me, oh, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I think a key is going to be how successful um, Maker is. I think his name is Maker Maker. Um, yeah, he, Maker Maker Howard. Right. And so he was the number 17 ranked um, high school player, basketball player. He's about seven, seven feet tall. And he chose to go to Howard. I think that's going to be a key test for this question, because if he um, if he does well, if Howard, I think one of the things that Howard will have to do is to get into some big tournaments and in its non-conference games, play some like Big Ten schools, you know, some big name colleges. And if, if they can um to help him develop his talent and build up his reputation, get on television. If he's successful and, and gets drafted high, then I think that will encourage other top ba um, black basketball players to go to, go to HBCUs. But if, he, if, he, if his effort falls flat and, you know, um, heaven help if he were to transfer to a PWI after a couple of years because he's discouraged, <laughs> that'd be the end of it. So I think that's critical. That, that he does well. It's almost like the Jackie Robinson thing. It's got to be the perfect situation. Mm. Uh, he's got to trust that university. That coaching staff has to be, has to have a history of success. You know, that program has to have a history of success in order for him to consider going there. And uh, like you said, they have to nurture him. Uh, the exposure must be there. The timing has to be right. It almost has to be a perfect storm, not necessarily uh, do or die, but a perfect storm would be a better situation. Yeah, uh, hey, hey, Tamik, I wanted to bring you back in, and, and Victoria, because it's, it's you know you're you're an administrator, you know, and it's one thing Russ is, oh yeah, Dion and this is good. What's the reality uh, of this situation? A has that horse left the barn? What, what's your take on all this when you see uh, mm -hmm. us talking about? this great migration to HBCUs and all that. Is that realistic, do you, do you think? I think it's very realistic, especially in today's climate, but I can tell you um, undoubtedly it's economic driven. And so um, if, if you know, being a product of HBCU and, and um, having worked at, I was uh, athletic director at Clark Atlanta um, and, you know, seeing from the view that I am, I am now, um, we we HBCU has to have a better infrastructure to be prepared for um, these scholar athletes to um, be on their campuses, and I think that's what Everson is saying. You know, it's got to be per it's got to be magic. It's got to be the perfect time and perfect scenario. Um, I think that the power of the student athletes and their voices being being you know amplified now, and um, I think the competitive opportunities are available now because we play a lot of non-conference, you know, games. We're, we're, you're seeing more and more HBCUs win those games. And so um, I think it's definitely a, a great possibility, but I do think that, you know, we have to get into more, you know, financial support, alumni giving, you know, it, it, there is to me, this is me personally talking, there is to me no um, comparison in an HBCU experience versus a PWI. I mean, you, as a as a black woman saying that, um, holistically. So um, I, I would love to see you know that happen, but uh, Maker's going to be a great great shot at that, and I know he's in a great environment to to make it happen. Uh, it's great that you mentioned that because that transitions into our next panel. We've got we're going to actually bring on uh, two young young folks uh, who attend HBCUs and two young folks. Uh, who attend uh, a predominantly white institution. So we're going to get their uh, perspective on this. Then we're going to bring everybody back because I, I, I did want to ask Victoria uh, one last question, maybe, you know, in the next segment. But what can PWIs do to, you know, everybody in this panel has mentioned the nurturing of HBCUs. Uh, what can white 
PWI, uh, PWIs do to nurture black students. So I'd like you to consider that. And we'll get to that after we hear from our uh, young folks who attend dueling institutions. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to turn it back over to Kendall. Wonderful. So now we're going to invite, uh, we've got uh, Jordan Clark, we've got Jayla, we've got Parker. Perfect. Yes. And Sanea. Perfect. All right. So these are our, our current students and very recent alum, uh, Sanea Williams, recent alum of uh, ASU. So, so Bill, please take it away. All right. Uh, Thank you, thank each of you students for giving up. I know that you were busy burning the midnight oil to make this, <laughs> so I appreciate it. But uh, let, let's start with you, uh, uh, Sinea. Um, coming out of high school, what was the most important uh, consideration to you when you were choosing where to go to, uh, where to, go to college? You, you know, you had the world was your oyster. Right, right, absolutely. Um, I believe my biggest, um, really the biggest thing that I needed from a school was a place for me to grow up, a place for me to feel uh, kind of what Tamika said, a good fit for me. Uh, I was very well endowed in track. I had run track for 10 years at that point. Um, that was my world. I had gone to predominantly white high school, middle school, most of my interaction with African Americans was my family and my track teams. So um, that was kind of the main thing. So when I had gotten some offers from NIU and some other PWIs, um, I just didn't want to be in the Midwest. So uh, I got an offer from Hampton University from Coach Pierce and considered that I hadn't been on the East Coast that much. And I was going to be third generation HBCU. My Parents, grandparents all went to Southern University. So I uh, was, was very um, big on HBCU schooling. Uh, so that was one of the biggest items I was looking for was a, a good culture and a good fit for me as an individual. So you went, to, you went to Hampton out of high school? Yes, so I went to Hampton for two years, ran track there for two years, and then I transferred to Arizona State. Uh, before for, I get to Jordan, why, why did you transfer and, and what's it been like? So um, for a plethora of reasons, it, it really was the perfect storm for me. So I uh, went to Hampton. That was one of the best experiences. I could not have chosen a better place to start to learn and grow as a young African-American woman. Uh, just being around other like-minded African-Americans, people that looked like me that were starting their own businesses, creating their own um, webinars, like all types of things going on. And so to see people that looked like me achieving great things was so important for my development. Uh, track wise, I had fallen out of love with the sport and just it was not working for me long term. And that's uh, at my sophomore year, I started to think, you know, like, what am I going to do long term? I don't see myself going to the Olympics. I don't see that um, being what I want to do. So what what is next? And so uh, that kind of leads me to uh, going to a careers in football forum event that the NFL had put on. Um, after that, I started to think, you know what, I'd, I'd like to pursue something within sports business. And so ended up getting an opportunity with an internship at the NFL. And that changed the trajectory of what I wanted to do. And so after that, I looked into sports business programs and ASU had a great one. Um, so that's what I pursued. And so I think uh, when I went to Hampton, it made me the woman I needed to be in order to transfer to ASU. I became one of the first president of sports business scholars organization on that campus. Um, and so I, the person I came out of high school being, I wasn't confident enough um, coming straight from there. I had to go to Hampton to get the tools, to get the confidence in order to step into those rooms that I don't look like everybody else and to fully show up as my true and authentic self. And I, both schools, it was the perfect storm um, as Everson um, kind of mentioned earlier, so. Uh, just to mention, uh, your, your father, uh, Aeneas, is the uh, great Hall of Fame, uh, Hall of Famer in the NFL. Yes. Uh, from, from Southern, by the way. I don't, know, don't right. know if he was disappointed when you left. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Jordan, same question to you. Uh, 
what went into your decisions to uh, uh, to attend you know, university uh, when you were out of high school, coming out of high school? Uh, coming out of high school for me, uh, the biggest thing I wanted to do was put myself in the best position to succeed in my sport. So I uh, kind of went evaluating programs, you know, my father and I would go through and, and look at systems and things that would fit me, you know, as a football player. And then uh, after that, I kind of wanted a family feel around the building, which I got here in Arizona State. You know, it's a predominantly black staff. Um, you know, Herm Edwards is our head coach. You know, my defensive coordinator is Antonio Pierce. You know what I'm saying? And those are those are men that I trust in my life. Those are men that I run through a wall for and, and men that I'm okay with yelling at me. So uh, kind of just looking for a family feel and somewhere that fit me as a football player. And then uh, third, I wanted a school that kind of valued academics. And I think that I get that here at Arizona State. Um, there's a great setup over there at CSAC where, you know, I can I can go and there's tutors available all the time, study halls and things like that. I have all the all the best study tools and things I need to succeed in school and as well as athletics here. So uh, it was a it was a pretty easy choice for me. Well, where did HBCU uh, come into play? I don't know if you've heard the rest of the conversation, but Jamil Hill wrote this piece saying people like you <laughs> should <laughs> attend HBCUs. Um, how did you feel about it? I know it sounds great intellectually, but yes, sir. What, just your thoughts. Uh, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we have a, uh, we actually have Southern, like where I'm from. So it's HBCU and Baton Rouge. And uh, the culture around that was always really cool to me. Um, Southern and Grambling, the Bayou Classic, you know, going to those games growing up and, you know what I'm saying? Kind of just being around that. I had a lot of family members that played football in the SWAC. And uh, for me, you know, I never got I never got any offers from those schools. Uh, those schools never recruited me. Um, but, you know, I always I always loved the culture around it. And I, I think that, uh, you know, they would, they would come to school and talk to me, but they didn't really think that I'd be too interested in it. So they never really, you know, offered or pursue too greatly. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't something that they felt that they were going to, you know, put time into. But, um you know, HBCUs and, and the SWAC was like really important to me growing up, but I never really took that seriously. Like talking about. Is there anything they could have done to recruit you? And do you think that if you look at, you know, a guy like Aeneas Williams a lot, you think that if you were, if you had, a, if you were a good football player, it really wouldn't matter where you went, you still get to the league. Um, yes, yeah, sir. I do. I do believe they find you, you know, as long as you can play ball, they'll come find you wherever you are. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, so I think that, you know, this, uh, the mass appeal of a division one, like high profile division one power five school is just, is different. And it's hard to, it's hard to kind of stray from, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but I do know, I do know for a fact that, uh, that if you go to SWAC, you go to a SWAC school or HBCU and you play well, that they'll come find you. They'll come find you wherever you are. That's their job. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you, uh, our, our two HBCU folks, uh, Jayla Jones, Prairie View and Park Owens from Morehouse. Same question to you guys. Uh, coming out of school, uh, what, uh, I'm not sure, Jay, we'll start with you. What was your, um, uh, what were you looking for when you came out of school? Did you go to a, uh, did you go to a predominantly white high school? Uh, what, was, what was your, your uh, thinking? Um, my school was pretty well diverse. I went to a school in the South suburbs, uh, a little outwards of Chicago. Um, and coming out of high school, my main focus for college was being near family. Um, my mom and my siblings, everybody was making kind of a migration down to Texas. So before attending Prairie View A&M, I actually attended the University of Texas at Arlington. So I went there for about half a semester and actually being there is when I realized that maybe I should have, you know, took the college selection process a little, um, a little more serious. Um, because I didn't really like it. I just, I just don't think I fit in on the campus. Like it wasn't really comfortable to me. So um, because of that reason, that's when I actually made the move down to Prairie View. What went into that decision? And what was it? What was it? What was it? Was there something that ticked it off? And once you've been at Prairie View, just tell us the differences that you that you found. Um, immediately, the difference between the two campuses that I've found to be the loudest was being around people that looked like me and you know how you know easily how easy it was to connect to those around me. Um, the UTA is a predominantly white campus and I found that not being uh, you know next to students who I could immediately connect to it was it was hard it was like it wasn't a bad experience I'll say but I didn't enjoy it as much as I do now at Prairie View. I say when I first got to Prairie View 
um, automatically it was like friendly faces. Automatically it was like, you know, like, hey, you're my sister. Like you look like me, you know, come, you know, hang with us. It was so friendly and so welcoming, you know, in comparison to UTA where I kind of had to shuffle around to find people that I thought I would connect to. Uh, same question, Parker, uh, you're at Morehouse. Same question, your decision-making. I think you went to a predominantly black high school, but I also want you to take off with something uh, that Jordan said. A, just take us through your selection process, but do you think, and, and Jordan, you can weigh on this too, if you did not play football, if Jordan did not play football and was African-American, do you think the transition to be on a, a predominantly black campus may have been easier? Um, or does Jordan, I don't, I don't, all right. Well, you, you go first, Parker. Oh. All right, uh, my decision was made on November 9, 2016, um, because that is the day that Donald Trump got elected president. And my father, who was born in Kentucky in 1947, told me that that was the scariest day of his life. Um, and I just knew then I had to go to HBCU. I wasn't really going to try and tolerate um, some of the other uh, factors that go into going to a predominantly white institution and being a minority in a college campus. Uh, that just didn't sound like something I wanted to go through. Also, that got reaffirmed. Like my first week in college in 2017, in August 2017, was the Charlottesville riots that happened uh, around the University of Virginia. Um, and I just, you know, it was just never a question to me what where I needed to be in order to be safe and be able to cultivate my skills and my talents and, you know, put myself in the best like career path. Uh, I'm not an athlete, so put, putting myself in the best career path uh, post-graduation and I felt like, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Ron Thomas and all the fine folks at Morehouse were going to be that best opportunity for me to uh, accomplish the goals I have set for myself. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I want to ask one more question, but I think Kendall, I'm supposed to turn back over to you. I was curious to hear uh, Jordan quickly from you. Do you think that uh, you being an African-American athlete, football player on uh, ASU campus, do you stand, does it make you a little more special than the quote unquote, the average black student? I think, I think so 100%, you know what I'm saying? I think uh, over, over the summer I was involved in an incident uh, at a Whataburger where this, where this white woman called myself and my teammates the N word like three, four times in a drive-thru. And um, you know, the, the, the manager at the Whataburger kind of didn't, didn't say anything, kind of just let it happen, you know what I'm saying? I'm not knowing that we were student athletes. And then whenever we tweeted it out and and he found out that we were student athletes and Whataburger was calling us and apologizing. And, you know, he was trying to reach out and all that stuff. So I think, I think definitely, you know, being a student athlete here kind of places me above the average African-American student that attends this school. Mm. Wow, well, thanks for that's a whole nother <laughs> well, that, that we'll get to. Hey, and Victoria, I want to uh, let you have the last word on this before I turn it over to Kendall. Uh, what can, uh, PWI, you heard what Jordan just said. Uh, what can PWI, I mean, predominantly white institution do to make its black students, whether they play football, basketball, or not, feel more comfortable? I have a long list here, but I want to address this first. I think this is illustrative of the, the burden that black athletes carry and the expectation that they perform this work. Um, so within intercollegiate athletics, within the university campus and university community, and then also more broadly, the, the college town. That, that black athletes historically for nearly a hundred years now, depending where we are geographically in the United States, have been doing the work that we cut, we as in educators in higher education should have been doing um, in all sorts of ways. Um, so this is one example of that. Um, but the, the first, I've got five points, five things um, folks who work at predominantly white institutions can do to better support black athletes or continue to support them because some institutions definitely are. And I think, you know, ASU is one of those schools, not to like pat ourselves on the back here, but it's true. <laughs> um, so the first is to listen and trust your athletes, your black athletes. Um, again, these athletes have been expected to do this work and we should be doing a better job to lift up and support them and actually get it to the point where they don't have to do the work anymore. We could be anticipating it and doing it for them. 
Um, one example, Kane Coulter. If you look at the Power Five conferences, they virtually adopted every plank on Kane Coulter's platform. But at the moment in time when he was attempting to unionize Northwestern football, that was seen as a problem. We should have been listening. <laughs> um, Nigel Hayes at Wisconsin, another example of this, where the athlete is doing the labor that the school should have been doing, addressing racism and fans in particular at Wisconsin football games. Um, and um, Anna Cockrell at the University of Southern California, track and field athlete who decided to do a survey of intercollegiate athletics at USC and get numbers on the underrepresentation of black people in um, institutional roles. She's doing that work. Let's listen to our athletes. The second is to support name, image, and likeness. Ramogi Huma of the National College Players Association says that name, image, and likeness is an economic justice issue and it's a racial justice issue. So if you want to support Black athletes, you should be supporting a full expansive form of name, image, and likeness. The third is to support Al the Alston case, um, which may or may not be taken on by the Supreme Court shortly. This is looking at grant and aid as an artificial restraint and a cap on the compensation that athletes receive. It's educational, so let's adopt lifetime scholarships. Um, this is absolutely something schools should be doing. Invite students back any time in their lives to get another degree or two degrees. Um, the fourth is to find your people on the academic part of campus. There are former students, student athletes all over university campuses. Find those people, those are allies and advocates um, and academic allies as well. And then the last, maybe a little provocative, and is worthy of an entirely separate conversation, but that is to spin off football. Um, football at predominantly white institutions and especially in the power five, that relationship that football has to the university is different than other sports. It serves marketing functions, it serves diversity functions, it serves entertainment functions. And we need to accept this, think about it honestly, and, and start to think about how we can support athletes who play football in a way that's different from other students on the university campus. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, Victoria. Uh, can I, can before, I chime in? Do you, do you have time for me to chime in? Yeah, well, actually, story? what I'd like to do, I'd like each of you, I'm glad you volunteered, Ron. I'd like each of you, uh, Ron, uh, Tamika, and Everson and Edwin, to give a final thought on this. So, Ron, you you go first. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about an experience I had last year. You know, I teach a sports reporting class. And so I usually take them to, to Morehouse basketball games to teach them how to cover a game. But, in, in, you know, and we did that. But in addition to that, I thought it'd be interesting to take them to a totally different environment. And Georgia Tech is maybe a 15 minute drive from Morehouse. So I, um, I arranged with Georgia Tech, I think I called their sports information people to see if I could get, you know, about 15 press passes for my students. And so we could go cover a game because Morehouse was playing Georgia Tech in a mid-season exhibition game. And of course, the teams are not comparable at all. They, I mean, they beat us 82 to 54, I think. But the thing, but what was important to see was after the game, you know, first of all, my students were thrilled. So for black students at a school that has only 2,000 students, here they were in an in a arena that probably seats 15,000 people. You know, they're in a professional press box. Uh, they got to go to a press conference. With, um, and interview the two coaches. It was, you know, like being, seeing what they see on ESPN. So it really gave them the feel of being a professional reporter, which is one of my goals. But the other thing that happened was, and they did get to ask some questions, but the Georgia Tech players, they had two players who were the stars of the game. They were just thrilled to see Morehouse students in the press room. I mean, I'll just quote one, one of them called it. He said, I think it's fire when we asked him what it, what it felt like. And he talked about, you know, how excited he was to have played at Morehouse. And uh, he said next year, you know, we should play at Morehouse because he had been to uh, HBCU games and he knew what the atmosphere is like. And um, so another, st uh, his teammate said, you know, I wish you brought everybody from Morehouse to the game. And so, um, <laughs> and so here they are, you know, they're at predominantly white school and they hang out at Morehouse for part of their social life. And so it would, I think, be a great exchange in, in that way for them to come to Morehouse and play. It would pack the house. It'd be financially good for everybody. And also, I was even thinking beyond this, that maybe it'd be possible for, at a Georgia Tech, 
for um, an arrangement being made that some of their um, black students or white students if they want could come to Morehouse and take some of the courses we have like social justice courses, courses about Martin Luther King and, and things of that sort that they probably cannot get at Georgia Tech. So it could be a cultural, an athletic and an educational exchange. And I, I think it'd be terrific for both schools. That's a great idea. Copyright, Ron. <laughs> uh, Ta Talica, uh, uh, final, final words on in, any, anything uh, that you'd like to talk about relative to this subject. Yeah, no, I, I think my final word would just be to um, continue to disrupt the um, campus codes of silence. I think that we've got to get campuses to really invest in their own mission. I mean, we've been very performative with all of our statements, um, but I think the reparation for historical negligence um, is what I'm really looking at every day. So um, that would be my last word of encouragement. Everson, uh, some of your thoughts about this conversation and kind of take it any way you like. Well, you know, we always uh, talk about what uh, white people can do for us. And, and I think the main thing is whatever they do is great. Uh, we always want more. <clears throat> but when, you're, when you are an HBCU athlete, former athlete, alumni, educator, staff member, we need to make sure we take care of our business first. And I, I think that's always been the mantra for black people. Make sure that when these, uh, 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 these times of, of pandemic and, and coronavirus are here, look forward to the shift in, and the change. So if that shift and change comes as it is now, because a lot of people, a lot of African-Americans are saying, why am I giving my money to PWIs when this is the result of it, when you see what's going on in the world today. Well, regardless of what they're doing, we need to be ready to accept whatever change comes our way in a positive manner. So whenever that change does come, we have to be prepared uh, and, and we shouldn't be surprised uh, that this is coming because we should feel that we deserve it. That's the main thing. Uh, that's great. Uh, Edwin, you'll get the our Olympian, you'll get the, uh, the final word before I turn it over to uh, uh, Ken. Okay, I, I think it's been a, a, a great uh, way to absorb the feeling from, uh, from Jayla and Tamika and Jordan and Parker and, and Saina about uh, the importance of the HBCUs. And the importance of our institution is that if you're a coach and even an administrator in an HBCU, you've got to be part-time father, part-time mother, big uncle, uh, uh, a brother sometimes, a, psych a psychologist, all types of things, because you're really, really, really interested in the soul of that person. And uh, when I look at uh, the HBCUs, just the people that I know from Morehouse, you know, you want to go to an HBCU if you, if you uh, want to be like Jay Johnson. Uh, Director of Homeland Security, Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Satcher, who were the head of the CDC and Health and Human Services. We got uh, uh, Cedric, who's a congressman down in, in, uh, in New Orleans. And if you want to get a PhD in computer science, we, we, being in a professional league is not that important to us, but being in a profession, uh, professional sports, that's not important, but being a professional and, and reaching the highest level of a profession and a career or and being possibly the first person to ever do something that no one else has done. You could be a chemist or a computer scientist. Morehouse produces more PhDs in computer science and uh, pound for pound than anyone else from their computer science. So those are the students that we want to get. Uh, we want we want to have great, great sports teams as well, but we think that we can attract and all the HBCUs can attract uh, outstanding ac academic. Uh, academicians, outstanding students who are athletes as well. But more so, we've got to find a way to begin to participate and continue to participate in the market uh, for, for, for black and brown bodies in sports that's going on and we're, we're missing the boat now. So as I said, that renaissance, we need to get back to that. We need to find a way and there is a way and eventually the students will come back. Uh, and, uh, but we have to have a, a very good offering that it's not just sports, but academics, and uh, people building as well. Oh, that's great. 
Hey, listen, I'm going to turn it back over to Kendall, but just on a personal note, uh, I've really followed and admired everybody on this panel. It's really been a pleasure and an honor to spend, uh, you know, 45 minutes with you. Hope we could do it again. But thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, Kendall. Yes, thank you so much, panel. And thank you to our, our guest host, uh, William C. Roden. Appreciate everybody's time. Um, we're going to hang on just a few more minutes and uh, share some more information into the chat box. But uh, in the meantime, panel, if you need to jump off and move on to your next, uh, you know, busy schedules, please do so. Again, thank you to our students. Thank you to our experts, our whole panel. And thank you, uh, Bill. Really appreciate it.